to today's media landscape. As a law school, we think we're particularly well positioned to do this sort of uh, conversation where we hope uh, you'll hear a, a serious discussion about the issues and serious disagreement. Today we're exploring the following resolution. Partisan gerrymandering threatens to destroy our democracy. Arguing for the affirmative case are Karina Lane and Liz White. As most of you know, Karina Lane is a professor of law and constitutional law scholar who writes about the influence of extra legal norms on Supreme Court decision making. Liz White is development director of One Virginia 2021, a nonprofit organization that advocates for nonpartisan redistricting. Arguing for the negative are Hank Chang Chambers and Dan Palazzolo. Did, did it three times. <laughs> oh, okay. <coughs> Dan. Um, most of you know um, Hank Chambers. He's a professor of law who teaches and writes in the area of constitutional law, criminal law, law and religion, and employment discrimination. Dr. Palazzolo is a University of Richmond professor of political science whose current research focuses on coalition building in Congress in, and in an era of partisan polarization. Please join me in welcoming our moderator, Professor Mary Kelly Tate. Can you guys hear me? Welcome. We begin with 90 second opening statements from each member of both teams. We will alternate between teams for those statements, beginning with the affirmative. Following opening statements, we will have 30 to 40 minutes of moderated debate with questions from me and the audience. At the conclusion of the moderated debate, each team member will have 90 seconds for closing statements, again alternating between the two teams. Finally, we will end with a yes, no, or undecided vote, which results in a declared winner or a draw. Before we start the debate, we will now open with an initial vote on the resolution. Please vote yes, no, or undecided on the resolution. Political gerrymandering threatens to destroy our democracy. And the URL is polf.com forward slash law AB. So if you pull that up on your smartphone, it's polf.com forward slash law AB. You can also text it to law AB. You can text 22333 to uh, text law AB to 22333. Uh, answers so far? 20? We're short a few. <laughs> <laughs> uh -oh. So remind me, what is that? <laughs> I'm not going to show you the results until after You think, I think we have 35 votes. I'm not going to count who's here, but uh, we will proceed in the uh, interest of time. Uh, is there a few more minutes? Okay. Are you trying to close? 10 the, seconds. Trying to close the polls. I'm for trying, to, trying to, <laughs> well, <laughs> federal <laughs> judges <laughs> have been known to do that. I'm not a federal judge, but that has happened. Uh, <laughs> Let them vote. Let them vote. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, so, we good? 41? Okay. Uh, we will proceed now. I want to uh, let everyone in the audience know that I will be striving for equal time uh, for the teams, but I'm going to open for the affirmative and ask Professor Lane to give her 90-second opening statement. Um, good afternoon. Consent and accountability, these are the two pillars of democracy. It's the ability to pick your representatives on the front side and to kick them out on the back side when you don't like what they're doing. Partisan gerrymandering is an attack on both, and it is meant to be, 
an attack on both. The whole point of partisan gerrymandering is to take more political power than the will of the people give. In a gerrymandered state, for example, a party can get 49% of the vote and end up with a 60 to 39 seat advantage, almost two to one in the state legislature. That's Wisconsin, by the way, in a case before the Supreme Court. But it's not just the assault on majority rule. It's more corrosive than that. Partisan gerrymandering leads to party hardliners getting elected because it's the party that controls who wins. That polarizes legislatures, it eviscerates the middle ground, and it contributes to legislative gridlock. It also leads to voter cynicism about a political system in which the results of elections are rigged from the start, resulting in lower po polar t voter turnout and also lower uh, competition because smart candidates won't campaign in a district where they know it's already rigged that they'll lose. Partisan gerrymandering turns democracy on its head. Politicians pick their voters rather than voters picking their politicians. And the worst thing about it is it's what they call durable. The party in power stays in power. Not even a wave election can fix this. That's why partisan gerrymandering threatens to destroy our democracy. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Professor Chambers, your 90-second opening statement. Thank you, everybody, for coming out this afternoon for our first civil discourse. The resolution states that partisan gerrymandering threatens to destroy our democracy. Now, to be clear, I'm not a fan of partisan gerrymandering. However, it does not threaten our democracy. The core complaint regarding partisan gerrymandering tends to be that it deforms our legislatures. Simply, there are too many Republicans in the legislature, given how many Democrats there are in the state, or vice versa. Ironically, very few who complain about partisan gerrymandering complain that there are too few independents in office, given how many independent voters exist. A legislator that poorly reflects our voting patterns presumably is not democratic. But the real problem with gerry partisan gerrymandering should be that the legislature does not reflect our views and produces legislation that poorly reflects our democratic desires. The problem is not who the legislature legislators are, but that they don't represent all of our interests. But if we're concerned about how responsive our legislators are to our needs, partisan gerrymandering is well down the list of our problems. Low voter turnout, campaign finance, and a refusal to engage between elections are much more important than partisan gerrymandering. To be clear, I do not let partisan gerrymandering off the hook, uh, but I do want to isolate its effect. The alternative to partisan gerrymandering is a districting system that's not affected by partisan politics. Uh, that would create a system of districting based on fairly narrow sets of principles. For reasons we'll talk about in the open session, that would likely lead to a legislator that is legislature that's somewhat gerrymandered, even if unintentionally so. Uh, my partner will clean up any mess that I've just made. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Professor Chambers. Ms. Smith? So one would like to think that this is all our fault that we all live in our bubbles, we've gotten more polarized, and the democracy is actually working fine, and perhaps even too well, and that's why we have a gridlock in D.C. and in Richmond and in all state capitals. But political science models that measure partisan advantage already take into account residential sorting and our, ten our tendency to be with people who think like we do. In Virginia, a partisan advantage is currently 16%. 5% of that is accounted for by residential sorting, 5%. So more than twice that. The other 11% is due to how the maps are drawn. So I'm going to ask you a few questions. If partisan gerrymandering isn't a powerful influencer on who gets elected, then why do map lines snake through communities, dividing up groups of people who did decide to live by each other? They sorted, and the maps carved them up. If partisan gerrymandering isn't a factor, then why are gerrymandered states impervious to wave elections? If partisan gerrymandering doesn't matter, then why did the GOP lead a, na a nationwide effort in 2010 to target state legislatures to get control of the state houses just in time for redistricting, allowing them to lock in their control of the US House for the next decade? Can I get the first slide, Carl? We know why. They told us in the Wall Street Journal, he who controls redistricting can control Congress by Carl Rove. <laughs> so I have one more question um, and one more slide, please. 
So this is the 17th Senate District in Virginia, and that little divot up at the top, next slide please. <laughs> That divot represents a half of a neighborhood that's about the size of Windsor Farms. Why would they carve out half a neighborhood? I can tell you, Senate Democrats wanted to protect their incumbent, and before the maps were drawn, there was this up-and-coming Board of Supervisors member who had declared his intention to run against him. He woke up the day after redistricting and found that his house is in the wrong half of the neighborhood. So partisan gerrymandering isn't just about partisan politics, it gets really personal. Thank you. We will now move to the 30 or 40 minute. Oh, excuse me. Oh, no. I'm right. sorry, <laughs> Professor Yeah, we don't matter. And to think we that just gerrymandered. The, to think, to think the conversation that the professor, <laughs> not in the law school, pardon me. He was I'm more worried about time than uh, full expression. Excuse me. That was great. Well, you're wise to be concerned about time. Thank you, Mary, for being here. Um, Partisan gerrymandering is real, but it does not destroy democracy. The majority party can use redistricting to gain seats, as Republicans did in several states after 2010 elections, but massaging district lines every 10 years to gain a few seats is a long way from destroying democracy. Here are five points we might consider further. <coughs> First, gerrymandering comes in several forms, and political scientists have found that incumbent and racial gerrymandering, not partisan gerrymandering, have the most significant effects on election outcomes. Second, the effects of gerrymandering of all types are greatest in the first two elections after redistricting. The effects taper off over 10 years as populations shift within and across states. Indeed, tapering effects plus national tides explain Republican gains in state legislative races in 2010 in states where Democrats had drawn the lines a decade earlier. Third, commissions, the primary alternative to state legislatures, do not significantly increase the number of competitive seats. Moreover, redistricting done by state legislatures is more democratic than redistricting done by commissions. Fourth, political scientists generally and repeatedly find that the primary cause of uncompetitive districts and the efficiency gap is population sorting, not partisan gerrymandering. Republicans have a structural advantage through, quote, natural gerrymandering. Democratic voters concentrate in urban areas, whereas Republican voters are spread out across suburban and rural areas. Finally, evidence from our own state of Virginia shows that the effects of partisan gerrymandering are grossly overstated. For instance, there are 17 House districts this year up for re-election in which Republicans hold the seats where, President, uh, where Hillary Clinton actually won the majority in those districts. So I look forward to discussing these and other issues. Thank you. And my apology again, Professor Pellis. I thought that was concise. Uh, <laughs> so I'll begin. I'll ask the first question, and again with a, a notion toward equal time. Uh, what should concerned citizens think of what big data, you've touched on this somewhat, can tell us about the effects of political gerrymandering? Is it a sensitive, effective tool for such an inquiry? I'll, I'll start if I may. Um, I think that a couple of the topics, especially that Dr. Uh, Palazzolo brought up, um, tap into the use of big data in, in the map drawing process. It's not just that computer software has gotten increasingly sensitive and that maps are more precisely drawn than ever. It's also the amount of data and the type of data and the freedom to use that data that our legislature has that makes these maps really dangerous. It also makes them increasingly durable. So they do tend to taper off toward the end of the decade as population shifts, as people move into or out of areas or into or out of the state. But now they've got the data to know what subdivision is coming into that area, what the average house price is going to be, who's going to live there, and how they're probably going to vote. So they can account better for population changes and make those gerrymanders last longer. They expire a lot less easily. Um, they also, in, in the 17 districts that I know, you know a lot of people are, are really keeping a close eye on, that Hillary Clinton won and that are held by Republicans, legislatures also have the data to know how often you vote, what primary you vote in, probably what magazines you subscribe to, and they probably know who you voted for, even if they don't know who you voted for. So they also know how often people turn out, and they draw these maps based on the expected turnout of that year. Virginia has off-year elections. So 
no member of the state legislature ever has to fight for their seat in a presidential turnout year. Um, so that, and those are just a couple of ex the examples of the big data that they're allowed to use. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, mean, I, I, think that's, uh, I think that's right. I mean, there's, there's, there's plenty of data, and, it, and the models are very, very precise. Um, but the truth is that voters respond to choices. And what we're finally getting this year is the Democrats are actually putting candidates out in seats that they could, that they could win. Uh, I don't think it's uh, an example of destroying democracy. I think the, the, the challenge is that Democrats need to get voters out in, in midterm elections, which is very much a democratic process. And so engaging the voter, getting organized, giving the voters choices are the key, it seems to me, uh, to, to this process. Would either teammate like to add to their yeah. colleagues' uh, response? I'll, I'll add to it. And um, I'll just say that um, it is about fielding candidates. But the political science data shows us that candidates don't, smart candidates don't waste their time in districts they can't win. And political parties don't put money into candidates in districts they can't win. And so, you know, to say, well, it's about choices, it's actually not just about choices. It's also about having competitive districts. And the fact is, 95% of us live in non-competitive congressional districts where our vote doesn't really matter. Um, and so I'd like to just add two other things about that. Um, one, responding, Dan, to your opening statement, um, there, there's an amicus brief by the political scientists, actually there's like three of them, um, one by geographical scientists, another by political scientists, but they said, beyond a statistical doubt, it is not political geography. There is less than one one thousandth of a chance that the skewed data we have in Wisconsin is about political geography. And here's just an example. Obama won in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. uh, Obama won in 2008 uh, by the same percentage that Obama won in 2012. Okay, same, same percentage of voters in that state. In 2008, those same voters, and they vote straight ticket, they voted down, and uh, Pennsylvania ended up with 12 uh, congressional seats going to Democrats. Um, in 2012, the same percentage of voters ended up with five congressional seats going to Democrats. Now, um, the difference actually, uh, so uh, 12 congressional seats and, uh, versus five, um, you would have to believe that some 600,000 people just moved into, just moved from where they were, because the numbers didn't change much. This was people moving. You would either have to believe that some 600,000 people just up and moved, disenfranchising themselves, essentially, or that the cause is that they drew the maps. They changed the maps. That's what happened. So I'll just Thank you. add that up. Could Professor I, Chambers, or yeah, just just a just a, a quick a quick note. Just just want to make sure. Just one of my little little bugaboos there. There's no such thing as a wasted vote. Let's be very clear. There's no such thing as a wasted vote. Margins matter. If you get elected in a 70-30 district, you likely govern differently than if you get than if you get elected in a 55-45 district. So margins matter. So the concept that th people are having their votes not counted or that their votes are wasted just because they don't vote for the winner, that actually is a big part of the issue. That very notion is what gets some people to not vote. So it's a little, little dangerous to, to go down, go down that, that path. Uh, j just to notice, it's also very difficult to, uh, to, to look at who won X, Y, and Z and say, well, gosh, this is what we should have expected. Governor of Wisconsin got reelected while President Obama wins two, wins two elections. It would seem as seem a little odd that a far-right governor of Wisconsin would get elected at the same time that a moderate Democrat would get elected president with the same, with, with the same populace. That's kind of the point. Different elections have different electorates. So it's actually quite difficult to figure out exactly what the numbers are telling us. So be really careful when you see those numbers, what exactly they're telling us. Yeah. Um, a couple things. Good points. I, I think there is partisan gerrymandering. I'm not, I'm not denying that. And there are certain states where I think it's, it, there are exemplary uh, cases. I think Pennsylvania is one of them. Um, as for the amicus brief, I haven't read the brief. You can get political scientists to kind of write amicus briefs. I mean, that's, that's not a problem. The people that I'm citing are leading election experts 
in political science. Gary Jacobson, Wright and Erickson, Nicholas Seabrook, these are based on massive amounts of data analysis. So let us not confuse the idea. That there's, no question in, in, there's no question that there's partisan gerrymandering, but it's not as significant, anywhere near as significant as racial gerrymandering or incumbent gerrymandering. Uh, I think Hank and I both would love to see more competitive elections. The problem is you can't often draw the districts. Take a look at Virginia and the maps. It is literally impossible to draw a Democratic district anywhere west uh, of Richmond, I think. Okay, so it's, 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 it has a lot to do with where people live. One final point in Virginia, just to, make, just, to, just to emphasize, it's really important here. The Republicans now have a 32 seat advantage in the House of Delegates, but there are, as I mentioned, 17 districts where there must be enough Democrats to win because Clinton won those districts. If they won all of them, they'd have a majority. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask one more question, then I'm hoping that the audience will jump in. And uh, my question is this. With regard to the case before the United States Supreme Court, I think it got wide coverage that uh, Chief Justice Roberts said, what, essentially, what are we to do with this sociological gobbledygook? And I'm curious about what both sides think of that particular intellectual uh, response to the situation at hand. It, uh, maybe it has to do with judicial manageability of the problem, uh, a variety of things, but could, I will ask the affirmative to please respond sure. to that yes. and then the, okay. the, so, the negative. Um, uh, what we're really talking about, and actually I want to just t t take it back just a moment, because I think it's important actually to understand um, what it is that gerrymandering is and why this is happening. So I just want to take a moment to do that first. The entire point of gerrymandering is diluting votes wasting votes and I know that's your, your, your bugaboo but let me just say the entire point of gerrymandering is cramming one party's voters into a particular district to ensure that that party's, that party's uh, candidate wins by a ton by a ton, by overwhelming margins. But what that does is it also ensures that those voters are not in play someplace else. Meanwhile, the other party's votes are spread just enough to give just enough tilt, just enough partisan advantage, so that that party's candidate will win no matter how many of the, of the other's voters show up. It's packing and cracking. And here's one other thing about that, is that now, with this more sophistication in the, uh, in the computer software and so uh, software in information, there's this whole new type of gerrymandering, which is called slicing, slicing and dicing. And so, whereas before, up until, up until now, what we've seen is you're just packing party uh, voters into one district to just waste their votes or to, to make them win by so much that they're not in place somewhere else. Now what we're seeing is that the software can identify not only who the voter is, but whether they are uh, a, a whether they are um, somebody who is a partisan voter, somebody who votes in the primaries, somebody who is giving money, somebody who is an activist, a party activist. And what they're doing now, what the, what the software is capable of doing now, is not just cramming voters into a district, but putting the activists in districts where they won't count. Where, where they could show up and vote and so can everybody else and you won't beat it. That's what they mean by durable. Um, but um, So you asked though, what can you do about this? And I think it's important to understand what gerrymandering is to say what, what can you do. So in the particular case before the Supreme Court, the political scientists, and I think they're pretty leading too because I've been reading on this stuff, but um, they said there's three different tests that you could use. And in this particular case, all three tests pointed in the same direction. All three tests said this is extreme gerrymandering. It's one of the five most extreme gerrymandered districts in the entire United States. Here's the test. 
Um, one, and the one that's most known, is the efficiency gap. Now, I, you know, I don't want to get super hyper-technical, but what it's doing is it's comparing one party's wasted votes, it's a, it's a term of art for people writing in this, one party's wasted votes with the other party's wasted votes. You subtract one from the other and that measures the amount of extra wasted votes that one party is bearing and you say what's the proportion of that to the total number of votes. When that number is high, that means you've got a, a big number of wasted votes for one party. Okay, and in this case, Wisconsin's uh, number is 13 percent, and the district court found that one to two percent of that was geography. The political scientists actually say it's three to four percent, but nevertheless, you're looking at like an extra nine percent that is not explained by geography. That's one test. The other one is um, uh, a proportional representation party symmetry, and what they're saying is when one party gets 48 percent of the votes and gets ends up with a 69, 60 to 39 seat advantage, then when the other party gets 48% of the votes, they shouldn't only have 30 some seats. They should also have that advantage. So it's an asymmetry. And then the last one is this median mean test. And what they say is, how much of the vote do you have to win to get to the median district, to get a majority? And what they say is, in Wisconsin, for example, Democrats have to win 54 to 56 percent of the vote to get, if there were 100 districts, to get the 51st district, to get the majority in the state. Republicans only have to win 44 to 46 percent of the vote to get that, again, in a, in a, if, if you have 100 districts, the 51st. Three different so, tests. I don't have a view about them, but I can tell you um, what we're seeing now is they're all pointing in the same direction. Thank you, Professor. Sorry, Brandon. that was. I'm long. going to um, I'm going to give the other side an opportunity to respond to uh, Professor Lane's detailed uh, yeah. analysis of the three, yeah. and I'd like to know both both sides' um, feelings about yeah. Chief Justice Roberts' yeah. remarks about where sociological studies or political science studies fit in this analysis and how judicially manageable the problem is. Yeah, uh, d d quickly on, on, on the Chief Justice. Uh, he needs to pipe down. He is a much smarter <laughs> man than that, and, it, and he does himself no favors by acting like he's stupid. Yeah. It's unacceptable yeah. for him to yeah. act as though sociological uh, information and political science information is irrelevant. Th there's just no excuse for that. He is way too smart for way too smart for that. Uh, so I'll just put that to the side. Karina ha has certainly suggested that yes, partisan gerrymandering exists. We don't disagree with that. That's why the, the, the resolution is whether it's destroying our democracy. Now, ironically, when Karina dis discussed the concept of cracking and packing and the idea of sticking a lot of your opponents into one district so you can, can, can have uh, m more districts outside that are, a little, uh, that are a little less concentrated, she just described what our districting will look like if we don't have partisan gerrymandering. That is, if we go to traditional districting principles, that is exactly what we're going to get. We're going to get gerrymandering in theory without intent, but everybody knows what's going to happen. When you have an urban party, like the Democratic Party, what ha what's going to happen is you're going to get districts that are closer to 70-30 in the urban areas, and then on the outside, they're going to be less than 70-30 for Republicans. So I don't disagree with what you're saying at all. It's just that the real alternative is that we're going to have a, a situation where without partisan gerrymandering, the Democratic Party is going to have a headwind. Now that's fine if that's what folks want, but I don't think that that's a great solution to the concerns that go along with, with partisan gerrymandering. Thank you, Professor Chambers. I'm going to give the two other team members 30 seconds, and then I want to throw this to the audience. Um, for audience questions. So if, if there's anything that either one of you wants to add, but very briefly, please. Would um, I'd Ms. throw Smith and very, then. very briefly into the discussion of um, competitive districts, and I'd say that a competition is not necessarily the uh, goal of redistricting reform or of fair districts. Competition is often um, what is lacking unnecessarily with unfair redistricting. Um, I agree with you that in Virginia, it is really hard to draw a red district in Arlington or a blue district in Southwest Virginia. That is 
an artificial line at best and we're no better off than we are now. But you can draw them better than they are. In 2010, there was a statewide student competition. Students were given all of the data, they were given all of the software, and they were given the good government rules that we advocate as an organization. And it's things like transparency and keeping communities together and keeping communities of interest together, honoring cities, counties, and towns as a basis for drawing these lines, and not using partisan data, not even having access to it. And the map that the Virginia Senate drew out of 40 seats had six competitive districts. The average student map had 9.6. So that's still 30-something seats that are not competitive, and that may just be how Virginia is. But partisan gerrymandering, the unfair redistricting process, allows uh, legislators to wring out the last vestiges of, competitive, of competition where there should naturally be some. Thank you. Yeah. I think Liz just pointed out some really important marginal, potential marginal effects, assuming that you had nonpartisan re redistricting. Um, and I think uh, uh, Karina's point is also well taken. I, I, I agree with Hank that it's okay to use social science you know, data, but uh, let's get beyond that for just one moment. I would just like to ask the audience, by a show of hands if you don't mind, how many people have moved in their lifetime? Hold your hands up. Keep your hands up. Now, from those who have not moved, how many people know somebody who's moved? Okay, we may not be at unanimity, but we're darn close. So let's get beyond the goggly goop. The fact of the matter is, Americans are a very mobile population. We move. And when we move, we move next to people who are like us. And so some of you might look, for example, and think about who lives down the street from me. Are they Democrat? Or they, they agree with me politically or not? Most people probably would say yes. If you say no, you're an outlier. Uh, that is the challenge of redistricting, uh, and that is the fundamental problem that we're dealing with here, is that Americans have basically put themselves in places where there are people like them, and our politics tend to reflect this idea of joining together people who are like them, and the messages from the parties focus on these kind of homogeneous kinds of messages. Anyway, that's enough Thank for you. now. Thanks. And now we will turn to audience questions. We are hoping that there are brave audience members who would like to pose questions. If you have a question, please come to this microphone. Thank you. I, I saw a gentleman, two gentlemen. <laughs> no questions from associate deans. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm wondering in particular about the, the issue that was raised earlier about the effect of gerrymandering on uh, uh, sort of pushing both parties to the extremes. Um, I, I thought Professor Chambers' point about no vote is wasted was an interesting one, but uh, under partisanship, uh, partisan gerrymandering, might you see more 30-70 districts than you would see 55-45 districts or not, and, wh and what effect gerrymandering has, not necessarily on the outcome, the binary outcome of any particular district's election, but on sort of the, uh, the sort of politics of, of each party, um, regardless of, you know, whether they're going to win any particular district or not. That's actually a real good question that gets into issues of primaries as well. And that's, a, and that's a hard one because one would think, based on the last redistricting in Virginia, that we wouldn't see any new, uh, any new congressmen or congresswomen. Uh, of course, you can ask Eric Cantor how that worked out. Mm -hmm. So the concept that you can't change folks through, for example, primaries is an issue. Now, I do want to note, note one thing. If we want to talk about how, uh, how polarized folks are, we could look at the U.S. Senate. Just recognize the U.S. Senate, of course, is not districted. Everybody runs in a statewide election in the Senate, yet somehow we still have polarization. That's one. Number two, if you want to think about the differences between folks who are running in areas where they're 70-30 or folks where they're running 45-55, consider the folks who were in the middle in the Senate. And ask yourself how many folks you needed in order to stop the end of the Affordable Care Act a couple weeks ago. The middle still matters. It always matters. And it's dangerous if we say, you know, the middle doesn't matter because we have partisan gerrymandering, because we've had partisan gerrymandering for the entire history of this country. So you've got to be real careful if you say partisan gerrymandering drives people away. Mm, not always, and not so much. Thank you. 
I would love to respond Liz. to the point about the Senate because you are absolutely right. It's a great barometer um, to look at the House that's divided into you where know, we vote in districts versus the Senate where we vote as a state. Just in Virginia's recent history, in 2014, the Gillespie Warner race was within a point, and the average margin of victory for a House rep or a representative was in the 30s. So that's just Virginia. That's certainly not true everywhere because, as we know, Congress is radically polarized in general. But I think as citizens, when we hope that something is going to happen in a bipartisan fashion in Washington, it's not the House that we look to. And it's not, I mean, one, because the margins are so much greater, but it's, it's not that the Senate is kind of our last great hope for bipartisanship. Um, and it's, it's backwards from how it was designed. The, when the Constitution was written, when the country was founded, the senators were chosen by state elected officials, and the House was supposed to be the, the House of the people that we chose. And now it is opposite. Now that the senators are elected in statewide races, we actually get a one-man, one-vote kind of say in who represents us as a state, whereas the House, because the legislatures, legislators get to draw those maps, they essentially get to pick who goes to the House. So in, in that democracy is probably supposed to function in the way it was originally intended, it's completely on its head when it comes to Congress. Thank you. Professor Lane, would you like to? Yes. yes. And I will give. Um, so I, I, I want to start with what Hank said about the middle matters. The middle matters so much. And we were just looking at a poll um, from 2016. There's still 41% of the people of this country consider themselves moderates. Now, they might not be a moderate next to you. Like, it depends. But they consider themselves <laughs> moderates. Um, here's, some, here's an interesting factoid. Um, in 1976, moderates were 30% of the House of Representatives. By 2002, they were 8%. They're gone. If you feel like if you feel like nobody really represents you and you're like, where's the middle? It's dropped out. That's because it actually has. And I want to take a moment to explain, you know, just to think about why gerrymandering causes that. Because gerrymandering gives you safe seats. Safe seats means one party controls it. It might be the packed party, the, the, the minority party, they control that. It might be the majority party that's, that's split uh, a little bit thinner, but they control that. And where the party controls it, you're, the, the constituent that the uh, candidate is pandering to is not the median voter. It's the partisan base. It is the hardliner that shows up at the primaries that are the partisan base. And so what we see is, is uh, hardliner politicians. And you just, like, you just have to look around and say, oh my gosh, it's true. Hardliner politicians and you've got hardliner policies. And um, I won't go into that but so much, but let me say this. Uh, one standard deviation change um, in, uh, what is the thing? Quotient, e, efficiency gap. In the efficiency gap, one of these main measures, has a larger effect on state policy than a change in the party of the governor of the state. That's how much this stuff actually matters. And um, I'm going to, well, I was going to say, I'll, I'll stop there, I, but there's more downstream effects to even talk about than you. that. Thank you. I'm going to pass the baton to yeah. Professor Palazzolo, and then there's a gentleman with a question. Yeah, I just want to second Hank's point. Uh, I think it's really important to look at the comparison between the Senate and the House. And I just also would point out again, what do political scientists tell us about polarization? Uh, it's not a function of partisan gerrymandering. It's a function of activist groups emerging in the 1960s and 1970s. Uh, it's a function of realignment in the South, which brought, you know, which basically did away with conservative uh, Democrats and replaced them with Republicans. It's the news media. Uh, these are all polarizing forces, and it is very clear that we are polarized at the elite level. People who are involved in politics and care about politics are really at war with each other. There's a polarization industry out there, okay, as Jonathan Rausch has pointed out. Groups exist, literally, to exist. There's an economic incentive, okay, to, for groups to exist. Uh, and so that's reinforced in our politics, much more so than it is in the general population. 
But again, it's not a function of gerrymandering. It's a function of so social and political forces that have been moving in our society for the last 40 years. Thank you. Yes, please. So it's clear why the court can address problems of unequal population or of racial gerrymandering through the 14th Amendment. But why can the court address an issue of partisan gerrymandering, which doesn't necessarily reach at that same basic 14th Amendment protection? So is the court the right place to go for a problem like this one for that reason? And um, in that same sense, doesn't going to the court for a solution threaten democracy as much as gerrymandering itself by overriding principles of federalism and local control? Thank you. I'm going to. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to answer your question first and say, having listened to those, uh, the oral arguments, uh, I'm sold. I, I hesitate to make a public prediction, but um, I think the side that was saying, court, you have to get involved because democracy, we are at a point we can't right ourselves. We can't, we're the turtle on, on our back, we can't turn it back over. Because the thing about gerrymandering is, once you have control, you build on that control. Then you continue to have control of the house and you continue to redistrict. And what they've said is, if you don't fix it now, uh, then when we get to 2020 and the redistricting, there has been an actual revolution in the districting in the last 10 years, in the software, in the information graphics that you've been able to get. So you haven't seen anything yet. They're saying what, um, what they're saying is that the things that were just gerrymandering that was just theoretical in the last 10 years is now here. We're just waiting for the next redistricting. So is the court the proper thing to, the one to take it? I think this is Baker v. Carr. I think this is, I think this is John Hart Ely. I think this is, yeah, you've got to take it. And the court has said, uh, yeah, we would take it if we had standards. And that's why I think it was really important for the political scientists to say, here's three different ones. Take your pick or take them all. But when they all point in the same direction, I think we've got this. I do want to take a moment um, to say, number one, politicians are telling you, they are saying it out loud and again and again, we can't compromise. We fear getting primaried. That's actually a verb now getting primaried, because if we compromise, we're not party loyalists, and we will be, it's not the people controlling the election, it's the party. And here's the other point about it. You say, well, what about the Senate? It's a really good question. Here's the thing. This is a testament to just how powerful and how corrosive gerrymandering actually is. It started in the House. Parties got so powerful and so hardlined and off-center that, frankly, the House has bled into the Senate, right? So now it's just, it is the party is off-center itself, and it's the same party in the House and the same party in the Senate. So you no longer need at least the gerrymandering lever that you have in the House in the Senate. The parties are off and running. They are, they, they have become more uh, hardlined. Thank you. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, one sure. or both? Yeah, sure. The, the question of whether or not one's, votes, one's vote is being devalued is something that's been important for probably 50 or so years since one person, one vote. So in some ways, the court has kind of set, set itself there as being the place to go to at least provide equality with respect to votes. So if one believes that partisan gerrymandering goes a little too far or a lot too far, uh, and in fact changes who who's going to be in control, then the court might well be the only place to, may, may well be the only place to go. Uh, I, I will note that the concern that the parties are in control and that the people are not, that's, that's a hard one. Because if the people don't have control, then it's unclear that the courts are the place where one can go to figure out or to put the to put Humpty Dumpty back together. The people at some point simply have to show up. And if the people show up uh, and the people turn out, then we'll figure out what the people actually want. Uh, when we talk about folks getting primaried, some folks can get primaried, of course. Uh, the fact that folks get primaried just means they lose their seat. That's OK. That's just sort of the way life goes. You, 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 you don't win the primary, you lose. That's, that's OK. And at some point, um, we'll figure out how you win even when you get primary. And of course, some people still win when they do get primary. We have 
two gentlemen standing up, and we're going to close qu questions there. And I'm going to let this gentleman, he's a student of mine, Kevin, <laughs> it's good to follow behind this gentleman. So two, two quick questions. Because you yes, all sir. agree, or seem to agree, that partisan <laughs> gerrymandering exists, would you also agree that the legislators drawing the lines are in a conflict of interest? Thank you. Well, you took the words right out of my mouth. Um, going back a little bit to Sam's question about whether the court is the right place for this, it may just be the last recourse for this issue because maybe democracy itself is not broken, but the legislature on this issue is pretty broken. If you can't hold them accountable because it's very, very, very hard to vote them out, then it's very hard. I do this full time. It's very hard to get them to vote against their self-interests. Um, so while we work on it from that end, the courts are an avenue to curb the worst excesses. And there's been various uh, attempts at different standings throughout the year, or throughout the years, uh, plural, not just this year. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to have to keep, uh, in the interest of time, answers a little sure. bit shorter. Can take it? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think it would certainly look better if we had some nonpartisan body that drew the lines. Show me a nonpartisan body. I think that's the question. And, and I personally feel like the, the founders got this right when they said the state legislatures uh, would be in charge here because at least they're somewhat accountable. They're elected, whereas a commission, I don't know, who are these people? So I think that's, that's the danger there. It's, it's, a, it's, a it's a tough call. Finally, I would just say again, <laughs> once again, the concern is incumbent gerrymandering more so than partisan gerrymandering. The Virginia map, for example, was voted on by both parties. It was accepted by both parties. It's both parties protecting their own individual interests more so than partisan interests. Thank you. We have a wonderful University of Richmond spider undergraduate, Kevin. <laughs> You have um, a question? Yeah, earlier before you were stating how it's gerrymandering that's causing the deterioration of democracy. Don't you feel like there are other attributes to this? Like you said before, there's lower voter turnout now than there ever been before. Don't you think it's the responsibility of the people to come out and vote and show the difference in it? Thank you, Kevin. I want to make sure I give Liz time, but I feel like that was going to me. So, uh, <laughs> at me, so. Um, so yeah, uh, look, the resolution is not gerrymandering is the only problem. Do you want to talk about campaign finance? Like, we could talk about a lot of different things that are threatening the health of our democracy. Is gerrymandering one of them? It's huge. It is huge. And when you say, well, the, but voters should show up, why should they? I, I'm just saying, like there's political scientists say it's rationally ignorant that they don't, that they don't take the time to find out stuff because they've got to figure out how much time it takes for me and whether it matters. And in gerrymandered districts, it doesn't matter. Can I add thank on? you. Yes, very quickly, thank you. I love to vote. I live to vote. I would <laughs> vote in like, every year. Oh, I guess like, we're in Virginia, I do. Um, I live in a district where there is usually, on, a, on an off-off year where it's just a House of Delegates election, there's one name on that ballot. I go anyway, but why, why, why would you? So I think it does depress voter turnout, and I live in one of the 17 districts that Hillary won. And yet, last time my delegate, not excluding this year, but the last time he had a competitive race, the maps were redrawn, and that University of Richmond professor, in fact, woke up the next morning and his house wasn't in the district anymore. So it's not even that they drew more Republicans in or drew more Democrats in or made it more or less competitive. They drew that guy out. That's a threat to democracy. That's disgusting. It's not how it should work. Thank you. Gentlemen? Yeah, I, I, I do have to say, and, and now it's, it's going to raise to the level of bugaboo to, are you kidding me? <laughs> it, it, it is, it's nice that we can sit here and ask, why do you go vote? There are far too many people who are one generation removed from me who find that question offensive. Who find it offensive. It's not acceptable to suggest that it's rational to not vote and therefore not to do it. There may be lots of things that it may seem kinda sorta rational not to do, 
but it's just not acceptable in this country to suggest that it's rational not to vote and that it doesn't matter. Margins still matter. There's a reason why we still have the Affordable Care Act as it is right now, because margins matter. So it's not irrational to go vote. That's number one. Number two, it's ironic because, of course, the whole point of partisan gerrymandering, or at least the suggestion is, if you want to measure it, you have to measure it based on the folks who showed up at the polls the election before. So in theory, if you want your partisan gerrymandering to go in your way, show up with as many people as possible, whether you're in districts that you're going to lose or districts that you're going to win. Why? Because folks will say, well, you know, 56% of the Democrats voted for Democrats, and therefore 56% ought to, ought, there ought to be 56% in the, in the House, right? I mean, remember the numbers that were suggested. 49% of folks voted in Wisconsin for Republicans, and they got 60 to 39. Well, so presumably, if more Republicans had shown up and it had been more like 52%, then the 60-39 is not that bad. So, so margins matter not only normally, and not only because it's appropriate and necessary to go vote, but they also matter in terms of the actual policy that you get. So it's a little odd to suggest that, that folks ought to, to not vote and that there's a rational reason to not vote when there's so many rational reasons to vote, even if you happen to lose. Thank you. Dan? Yeah, first, uh, appreciate Kevin's question. Just one correction. Turnout is not down, actually. It's up quite a bit compared to the 1980s. Um, dipped down a little bit last time. And I would just re underscore the point that Hank made. If more Democrats showed up in 2010, you know, Carl Rove could write any editorial he wants. But the problem is they didn't show up. If you don't show up, you lose seats. If you lose seats, you give control to the other party. The other party draws the district lines. and has marginal, marginal effects, but not overwhelming effects on partisanship. Thank you. We've now reached the point where we are going to have our 90-second closing statements. After the closing statements, which will alternate again between teams, we will vote a final vote on the resolution. And I am going to ask uh, Professor Chambers, would you like to begin with your 90 second closing sure. statement? Sure, why not? Thank you all so much for participating in this first civil discourse. This has been a great discussion about partisan gerrymandering, but you should still no, vote no on the resolution. Uh, <laughs> complaints about partisan gerrymandering rest on the assertion that the legislature does not reflect our political parties in proper proportion. This broad or small d democratic claim should be that the legislature does not reflect the full range of political views of our diverse electorate. But that problem is not due to partisan gerrymandering. It's due to our winner-take-all districting system, which tends to pit the strongest representatives from the two strongest parties against one another in a district battle. Removing partisan considerations from the redistricting process will, at best, create a districting system that yields bipartisan gerrymandering that still leaves independents out of the system, but makes sure that Democrats and Republicans get their fair share of elected officials. Independents, you are out of luck and you will like it. At worst, we will create a supposedly neutral system based on a small number of districting principles that will create a built-in headwind for the Democratic Party as long as it remains an urban party, and a built-in tailwind for the Republican Party as long as it remains a suburban rural party. That is precisely what a soft partisan gerrymander does right now. Partisan gerrymandering is annoying and unnecessary, but it's not the problem. Getting rid of partisan gerrymandering might help a little, like foregoing the chocolate sprinkles on a huge ice cream sundae. But a real democratic solution may require that we rethink dessert altogether. Our path is clear. Go vote, go get out the vote, and make sure your voice is heard between elections. But before you do that, vote no on the resolution. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Let's Democracy to me means being represented by the people you elect. Partisan gerrymandering is a threat to that democracy. It's getting worse and it's untenable. This gridlocked legislature that we elect is so entrenched in partisan brinkmanship that they cannot pass policy often, even if it's something that the vast majority of Americans want. Our Congress still hasn't passed Zika funding. Mosquitoes are coming north, they bite Democrats and Republicans, mm -hmm. and yet it is too politically expensive for either party to reach across the aisle or to compromise, <clears throat> even at, for the, at the sake of the literal health of their constituents. 
And if where we live and who we choose to live near really are to blame for the extreme districts, then why carve up the communities? Then why not just draw a circle around Richmond City? Why cut through college campuses? Why cut through parking lots and tiny side streets? Why take so much care to tear apart communities, groups of people who have common interests and priorities? Because partisan gerrymandering is a really effective tool in preserving incumbent power. And anything that can thwart the will of the people, that can determine who is allowed to even run in that election based on whether their house made it into the lines, um, and, and all but guarantee job security for a group of people who are supposed to represent an ever-changing electorate, that's a threat to democracy. And we can fix it. American history is full of movements like this that have, have had made legislators finally do the right thing, even if it's against their own interest. But the first step is admitting we have a problem. Thank you. Yes, well, thank you all for being here. This has been a lot of fun, enjoyable for me. I learned a lot today. Um, I'd say it takes a lot to destroy democracy. A lack of participation in the political process, fake news, a lack of education, attachment to demagogic candidates, perhaps most importantly, the obsession with elections themselves, as Alexa de Tocqueville points out. The worst thing for democracy is, is democracy is to believe and act as if democracy begins and ends with elections. But elections do matter. I surely do wish we could find a way for more voters to have more choices, for more elections to be more competitive. I would just say that the answer, the silver bullet, is not through changing the redistricting process. I'm sort of reminded in some ways of the drunk person who lost his keys in the middle of the night and looked for them under the lamp because that's where he could see. <laughs> Um, the fact is, it's hard to construct a democracy that creates more choices in a free society as like ours. So the evidence is in. Vote early, vote often, and vote no. <laughs> Thank you. Professor Knight. All right. Uh, well, you know, John Adams once declared that corruption in elections is the greatest enemy of freedom. And we're there. You know, this thing we think is working, this thing we love, and I have to say, you know, my comment was, there really is a political, I didn't make that up about voting, Hank, but, you know, it wasn't a moral comment. If you love voting, if you treasure the vote, you ought to care about this a lot. You ought to be voting yes on this motion because it does threaten democracy. You know, in the Wisconsin case, the Republican Party that drew the map, they actually had the audacity, this is like Karl Rove too, to say that this was about maintaining public Republican control, quote, under any likely voting scenario. Margins matter. Margins matter. Gerrymandering is about eviscerating the margins. So, you know, gerrymandering is itself wildly anti-democratic. The whole point is to manipulate the results of rep representative democracy to make sure a party wins even if they lose. In October, my favorite Supreme Court person, um, uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, said it effectively nullifies democracy. She was talking about gerrymandering. But don't take it from me and don't take it from RBG. Take it from conservative Fourth Circuit Judge Niemeyer, who wrote just this year, this problem, he's talking about gerrymandering, is cancerous, undermining the fundamental tenets of our form of democracy. Gerrymandering puts a party in power without majority support. It deprives voters of representatives that will actually reflect their preferences. It keeps them from voting the, voter, the representatives out, and it contributes to rancor and, and hyperpartisan gridlock. I urge you to vote yes on the affirmative. Thank you. We will now sure. proceed. I could make one comment before the vote. Okay. Um, if you have entered the room after the initial vote and you did not participate in the first vote, we're asking on the honor system if you could refrain from voting in the second vote. So please vote if you did participate in the first vote. Thank you. Dang, we should have voted. <laughs> <laughs> it's a low voter turnout. I know, it went by really fast. Oh, I mean. Oh, we didn't get to show. I know, it's okay. Okay, we're ready. Hang them down. Yes, Hang please, them down. Uh, please vote. Yes, no, undecided. 
Agree, disagree, undecided? I think we had 40. You don't mind waiting just a few short minutes. We're going to calculate the votes and we'll report back in about 60 seconds. Yes. So feel free to talk amongst yourselves while we confirm the votes voting here. Okay. Is everyone wonderful? Well, this was an absolute, the, the civility, the good humor, the erudition was amazing. We have a winner. The winner was determined by who moved the opinion the most. And the winners are the team disagreed okay. Hank and Dan. So here are the numbers. We're ours to lose, That's okay. I think we did. That's okay. So, so. still won the popular vote, though. That's right. <laughs> Absolutely. So I, mean, I, I do think this team can take take uh, comfort and enjoyment in the fact that they it's a majority. Well, and, 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 and who knows? They may be right. <laughs> they, they, they may right. well be right. right. But I, I do really want to say thank, thank, yeah. thank you to thank everyone you who, who came out. And I certainly hope, I don't know whether we have any, any official um, you know, comment cards or what have you, but if you like this, please let somebody at the law school know. Yes. Uh, yeah. If you didn't, just keep quiet. But if you really liked it, just, <laughs> just let folks yeah. know. And thank, thank so you all so much. We, we really do appreciate it. I believe. Outside, correct? And Thanks everyone's welcome. Thank you. Thank you.